Christ. Oh, hello. <laughs> Um, <laughs> let's see. If you're new here, welcome. Uh, Pastor Aaron would love to meet you, as would all the rest of us. Um, please join us for some fellowship in Dobstaff Hall through the doors left and up the ramp. That'll be after service, not during. Um, please pay attention to the exits. You can see the ones you came in, that also an entrance, this one here. But this little guy's hiding back here, just in case. You should know about that one. I uh, suggest or ask you to sign in on the registration pad so we know you're here. If anyone has a joy or concern, that's these yellow cards. They're in your pews. Fill it out. We are a church that prays together and shares, celebrates, things that go on in our lives. So feel free to do that, and then the usher will pick it up during the first song. Hmm. The Adult Ed series, our new series is starting, and it's called The Way of the Soul, What We Learn Along the Way. It's gonna focus on the stories of Jesus' Jesus's complicated journey in the Gospel of Mark. Our series is inspired by the 2010 movie, The Way. I found it on, I think it was Netflix. I haven't watched it yet, but it's there. It's there. Maybe it's Amazon, but you can look for it. It's the powerful and inspiring story of a father grieving against the complicated dynamics of his family and the surprising friends he makes as he walks the challenging, challenging trail of the Camino de, Camino de Santiago. Join us and Pastor Aaron each Wednesday, or each, I'm sorry, each Monday in July to discuss the stories from the Gospel of Mark. It'll be 7 p.m. in the meeting room. There are other things in your bulletin. Hope to see you at the um, Cougars game and hope you've signed up for that. Sunday school is on hiatus right now. We join with our Sisters, United Church of Christ, in saying no matter where you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. certainly overflowing. Um, today we will have communion. It will be wonderful. I've missed you all. I know that Pastor Tom did a great job a couple weeks ago, and I've been spending a lot of time with Gwen and Nancy and Hi. We watched, we walked the Pride Parade on Sunday. It was really fun. You can give us an applause, because it was not easy, and it was fun. Um, thank you to Alex for um, helping coordinate. Um, we actually won Again, the nonprofit award for the 4th of July Shopping Cart Brigade. Awesome. And Gwen, how much, you know how much money we raised? I feel like 636. Yeah, good job. We did a great job. And how many? 52 bags of food. I have to amend my Facebook post. 52 bags of food, that was amazing. So I've missed you all, I'm excited to be back here. Um, if you're wondering how I'm coordinating this, I'm coordinating my stole with my bruise. <laughs> Those of you who aren't on social media, I still have it. Um, yeah, I, the last, the Monday I was in New York, I was there all weekend, um, I fell hard on the, 
on the, the cement. Um, you know, New York's a busy place. No one really stopped for me except my friends. It was okay. It was fine. Everyone's like, everyone falls, and they just kept walking. It was very New York. Anyway, so happy to be here. Um, join with me in our responsive call to worship. Welcome to all who have come in search of God. Happy are those who find a way and follow that path. We do not make this journey by ourselves. Let us be God together in spirit and truth. Amen. Continue and join with me in the opening hymn. Please join me in prayer. God, we are so grateful um, for this beautiful day, this day where we can commune together with your company, uh, the fellowship that we find in this community, this community that lifts up your gospel of good news to everyone. So God, may we continue to grow in grace as we journey together, finding out more and more about you and how much you love us and the ways in which we need to live out that love as we journey through life in this world. May it be so, amen. So this is the time where we say a holy hello, where we pass the peace. You get a few seconds to say hello to your neighbor. <laughs>
seated. This is our summer time, and although we have a very good looking crowd, stop it. Um, a lot of people are watching online, they're traveling, and so sometimes we'll have special music and sometimes we won't. Uh, but give it up for the praise band. They're doing a great job today. So, um, we will get right into it. As you know, we like to introduce scripture, give it a context before you hear it. Um, and so here we are. We are in the Gospel of Mark. Hopefully you've been here before. Um, we'll be here again. But we are in a specific chapter. And the story that you're going to hear today is this, the story before, right before this, is Jesus raising a dead girl. You've probably heard that story a bit. It's miraculous and wild and wonderful. But he also, and I love to do this, and I could expand on it in a sermon later, um, he asked her to lie about it. People ask, did Jesus ever lie? And he asked her to say, and the family to say, don't tell the story. Don't say this is what happened. And he tells them to tell no one that he raised this girl from the dead because he knows that zombie girls would not be welcome in the first century context, which means he understood social norms and his audience. Jesus definitely understood what was happening in his community. A formerly dead girl would be ostracized to the rest of her community for all time. And some of that ostracization and understanding of cultural norms will impact the story we will tell today. Generally, we shouldn't lie, but of course, when it comes to treating humans more humanely, sometimes it can go either way along with hospitality. And then after this text, we find out that his cousin, you know, John the Baptizer, his fellow minister, is beheaded on a power trip on the whim of the leaders of his day. Mark does this, I believe, purposely. He, he couches this story, this story of Jesus being prophetic and sending people out and not being well accepted in these two cataclysmic stories in Jesus' life. So there's going to be grief in a little bit for Jesus. A grief, again, not of only being ostracized by his community, but very aware of the grief that will come when his cousin is killed. Jesus does and says all the things he needs to as he realizes this journey he will be on may not be long in this world, but he is going to make sure that his time on earth is impactful and meaningful. Let us hear the scripture. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not the, his sisters here with us? They took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no, no deed of power there, except he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went out among the villages teaching. He called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. 
So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed them with oil, many who were sick, and cured them. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. God, thank you for the words that you have given today to the gospel author Mark to share with us the ways in which you work in the world, the ways in which Jesus worked in the world, the ways in which we are to be people of a journey of beauty and hospitality in this world. May we continue to learn new things as we approach each text each week. Amen. So we are starting a new sermon series this month, and I called you out, and I, did, I apologize, Mastins, I didn't ask if I could call you out, but you, you are sturdy folks. And um, I jokingly said to them they felt pressure to be here today, but they didn't. I didn't require them to be here today. But last summer, they invited me to go see a movie. They're one of their favorite movies um, called The Way. Um, it stars Martin Sheen and Emilio Estevez, amongst other somewhat famous actors and interesting actors. And it was in the theaters, even though it came out in 2010, it came back out in the theater, and so we saw it in the theater. And at the end of it, um, one of my favorite traveling writers, Rick Steves, if you don't know anything about Rick Steves, had this beautiful discussion then between, um, and so if you can see that, I would highly recommend you do it, between uh, Martin and Emilio, and it was kind of like a sermon. I mean, I really felt like this idea of journeying um, this Camino de Santiago is sort of this not only ancient but beautiful and current thing that people are doing. And once I understood the way and saw the way, I actually looked around and realized lots of people do this journey. I know the Mathesons have. Um, there's, there's different parts of it. There's longer parts of it and shorter parts of it. And this year I had two couple friends go on it and apparently there's like a hashtag couples doing the way, I don't know. You know, there has to be a hashtag. And so when I looked around, I realized lots of people do this. They do this beautiful and ancient journey. And it got me thinking, right? I wondered about all the different ways in which we could learn from this. Now, we saw it last summer, and I knew this would be a sermon series for the summer because we are all journeying away back and forward. But I thought you would like to know maybe what this is all about. So. If you've never heard of the Camino de Santiago, it is also celebrated as called the Way, or the Way of St. James. And I took the official description, so you know what it is. This legendary pilgrimage. So I love how something that talks about itself calls itself legendary. That feels true, right? And I think it is, though. This legendary pilgrimage, rich in medieval allure, attracts individuals from diverse backgrounds to the magnificent Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela in beautiful, oh my goodness, Galicia, is that right? I don't, am I saying it right? Region in the northwest of Spain. This journey is not merely a trek, it is a profound spiritual voyage. The captivating tale behind this pilgrimage is really, truly remarkable. Imagine this, the remains of the Apostle St. James the Great are believed to rest within this beautiful cathedral. This extraordinary find dates back to the shepherd in the ninth century. Even more fascinating is the city's name, which is a homage to St. James, translating to St. James of the Field of Stars. For centuries, this remarkable pilgrimage has served as a dynamic crossroads of cultures, uniting people from across Europe and the world. It's a rich blend of traditions, languages, and stories, a living mosaic of global connection and exploration. It's not merely a path to walk, but it's an inward journey of transformation. And so I think considering how many of us travel over the summer in different ways, in different places, I was gone, not, not quite the same sort of trek in New York, but I did fall, which I feel like very feels like the way, right? Like this arduous hiking journey. And the thing that I think is so beautiful if you look it up and look to do it is, of course, um, journeys like this, like the way, are meant to be places of spiritual respite, right? So you're supposed to do something that taxes your body, that gets you out of the norm, which I think is what travel does anyway, and helps you reflect and see things differently, you know? Um, and so I think that would be, I thought that would be a fun focus. And so what do we learn when we pilgrimage as individuals or as a community? Because that's what we're doing together. 
we meet and sojourn to this place on a Sunday morning when you can sleep in or go picnic or go to the coffee shop longer on this beautiful holiday weekend. What is it that you want when you journey here? What can we learn from the purposeful decision to be in a place um, that maybe is doing things hard uh, like you would do on the trail, right? Something that is life-changing, something that is beyond ourselves. If you see the movie, and I think it is on Amazon, what you learn is this father, Martin Sheen's character, and his son don't particularly have a great relationship. And so I think it's very relatable. The movie opens with that difficult understanding, so I'm not giving anything away. And it opens with the fact that his son is going on this pilgrimage, which of course Martin Sheen thinks is a huge waste of time. And then it finds out that a terrible storm has hit and his son has passed away. And so he has to go and retrieve his son's body. And so he goes there grieving, sad, confused, upset, probably reluctantly understanding their own relationship. And instead of just bringing his son's body home, instead he decides to finish the pilgrimage that his son started and bring the ashes along the way as an homage to him. As modern Westerners, we are used to very mild form of hospitality, I will say. We like to go to new places. Raise your hand if you like to go to new places. Yes, we all do. But oftentimes on our own terms, right, and on our own schedules, and with our own acceptable level of comfort. I saw a meme the other day that's like, I'm not outdoorsy, I'm outsidesy. <laughs> and I related. Like, I'm not gonna hike for five days, I'll hike for three hours and then come back to an air-conditioned brunch, right? Like that's, I'm not outdoorsy, I'm outsidesy. And I feel like that, I really, really resonated with that. So I get that. When we travel, we plan where we will stay and find restaurants, we will eat in and budget for it all. And I totally get that, like I said. And I, I plan trips, of course, in the same way. When we were in New York, we ate our way through New York, we brunched our way through New York, we drag showed our way through New York, and it was epic until I fell. It really was such a great trip. However, in the ancient world, when you traveled, you really were forced to rely on the hospitality of strangers. It was actually kind of a fearful thing to travel, right? Not only roads were maybe less stable than they are today, but you really didn't have like all the conveniences. You couldn't leave your home and know that there would be exact sort of hotels along the way, right? There was no Hyatt app in the ancient world. Are you with me? Yeah, no Hyatt. And this well-worn trail, the Camino Way, is a hybrid, I think, of these two realities, right? Even now today. It costs money, and there's planning, certainly. And from what I understand, there's wine drinking. Am I wrong? I, I feel like my friends walked the Camino Way on their, it was actually their honeymoon, so I sort of got it and kind of didn't, because I was like, on my honeymoon, I think I'd rather just be, you know, somewhere very, very comfortable. But I did see a lot of wine pictures, a lot of wine glass pictures. So I was like, I get it, okay. But when you were on a journey in a foreign country, doing an ancient thing, where maybe some of the trails aren't quite as up to code as you would like them to be, there are unexpected things that come up. And you will often find, as our main character does in the movie, that he's relying on the hospitality and generosity of strangers. This passage that we read, thank you, Karen, always reading it so well, and this understanding of the way teaches us, I think, two important lessons that we can learn in our own journey of understanding who we are as Christians and what it means for us to be hospitable. The first is that generosity of spirit and good assumptions of others go a long way. What I mean is, on this journey of the way and of this life, we may find ourselves questioning the background or intention of others, right? He comes along and he wants to sort of do the way as a rugged individual, this Martin Sheen character, this father character. He wants to do it for his son, he's gonna do it, but he soon learns that it's really hard to do on your own. It's really hard to do on your own. And sometimes he looks at those companions and he questions their motives and they're doing it for different reasons than he is. And we can even look around in this room or even look around in our Christian faith and go, huh, I wonder what that person's story is. I'm gonna dismiss it because I'm not quite comfortable. But be careful when you do so. You may miss out on the best companions in life and the deepest wisdom. So the character at first thinks, again, he can do it on his own, but learns that he needs a group of companions. 
I think that the companions are a little interesting, so that's why you should watch it. They're very colorful, right? Wouldn't you agree? Colorful companions doing things for lots of different intentions, for their own reasons, bringing their own literal and metaphysical baggage, right, along the journey. But maybe the best part of it is what he realizes is not the journey itself, the physicality of it, but the connection he makes to the people that are around him. Connections to people of all kinds is truly the most meaningful outcome of the journey that our lives will take as well. And then in the text, we have this text today. We find that Jesus' hometown misses out on his wisdom. Do you catch that? I've always been so intrigued that Jesus goes to his hometown. He tries to preach and give wisdom and heal and do all the things he just did, right? We just learned he healed and brought back from the dead a little girl. And he can't do it in his hometown. Isn't that fascinating? He couldn't do it there. He couldn't do the big, miraculous things. Why? Why do you think he can't do those things? Anyone know? He's just a carpenter, and his mother is a single mother. Right? Did you notice the description of him in this passage? Isn't that just Mary's boy? I know there's some siblings and whatever, but there's a little stigma attached to that. Why should we listen to this person whose maybe father wasn't, wasn't around? And I often think that we think over spiritually about the time Jesus lived as a kid. And we, of course, revere Mary and we revere the situation at Christmas, right? The beautiful understanding we have. And while we see these things, visits from angels, premarital pregnancies, right, as holy and mystical, I wonder if everyone in his community maybe didn't see it that way. Can you, can you believe that? That some people were like, yeah, an angel came. <laughs> come on. An angel? Yeah, come on. I don't believe you. The angel visited her. She got pregnant by God. Like, right? Right? Like, you can hear it, right? The rumor mill, still rumoring, right? No matter what the century is. And so they missed out on his healing and teaching. Imagine that you were a part of community that could have had their teachings of God by Jesus and been healed by Jesus, and you all were like, uh, I'm not sure about Jesus. Maybe not. Not my cup of tea. We miss out when we misjudge our neighbors, those along the way, because sometimes we choose the people that will journey with us, and sometimes God chooses those people for us. And we need to be aware that there are lessons to learn in both those situations. That is why I love church life so much. That's why I don't think that we're supposed to, as Christians, just sit in our prayer closet, reading scripture on our own, praying by ourselves. While it's great to journal and pray and read scripture, obviously I love all that, do all that, I think that we're meant to be in community. And I love it because churches are often the most random and wonderful group of folks, right? We have 95-year-old prayer warriors alongside neurodivergent children who worship alongside families of divorce, who worship alongside families with four generations present any given Sunday, along with single folks, LGBTQ folks, right? Like, what other situation has this gamut of people in our midst? We as a community benefit from the presence of others, particularly people we may not have chosen to be in community with. So don't miss out on the wisdom all around you. Don't miss out on the connections you can make. Don't miss out on what I call the joy of funky and fantastic fellowship with others. That's the church, funky and fantastic. The second lesson we learn from this movie and this passage is that in order to truly understand hospitality, right, to give hospitality away, to embrace others, to say we have something for you, we need to be able to receive it. And that's maybe the harder part. I think we, in our modern Western world, struggle with generosity because we don't like to need others. Raise your hand if you love needing others. Love needing others. Like, I just want to be super needy. Please help me. No, we don't. We don't like that. Right? We are self-sufficient. We try way too hard to have it all together and pretend we are islands or that we have all we need. And when we do that, we rob people of the ability to be generous with us. Now, I wouldn't advise you to take nothing on a trip or a journey. 
Obviously, that's silly. If you know what I've started to pack, I've given up the idea on a longer trip of packing in such a way that um, I carry everything on the plane. I'm not a hero. I'm not a hero. There's people that can take my luggage onto the plane and off the plane, and I go boop, and I just pick, it's great. I don't have to like get things overhead, right? I'm not a hero, but do that, I love that. I always thought that it was a rather strange and vulnerable request for Jesus to ask of his followers. Did you see what he asked of them? Take nothing with you. Go two by two and take nothing with you. Now, there are two other versions of this that don't have the disciples, how do I say this, leaving with quite so little. But I think Mark is trying to make a point here that hospitality requires vulnerability. And that's really hard. That's really hard. Because hospitality, I think, brings people together in community. And when you rely on others for your food and your place to sleep, you, and they help you out and get to know them, you get to eat with them, you get to be on their schedule, right? We often want time want to be on our own schedule. When we do that, we miss out on being with other people. And what kind of person are we when we can't receive from others? Rejecting Jesus and his faithful disciples isolates communities. Welcoming them creates community. Jesus always meant for his followers of his way and the way and the future church to create new family bonds, surrogate families, and that healing and wholeness and connection is mutual. We need one another. God's love is something that we share. It's not something that we hoard for ourselves. And of course, what he says to them, if you are not welcomed, pick at that place, call them names, tell them they're going to, you know what? Is that what he says? No. He just says, get the dust off your feet and keep moving, right? There's no canceling them. They are just as beloved. They just are missing out on the beloved community. Their lives will judge them. What they miss out on because they didn't welcome your healing and your wisdom will be something they will regret. Their lives are less rich and abundant and beautiful because they sent you away, right? So there are communities like the one that Jesus grew up in who are less rich and abundant and beautiful because they didn't trust Jesus' word and they didn't take any of the teachings he said. And the disciples get the same experience. They don't want you. Put the dust off your feet and keep moving. And that beautiful word, I think, for us is that you don't have to save or rescue or heal everyone. Isn't that good news? Like, all right? Because sometimes I feel like we live in a world where the whole world is at our fingertips and there are atrocities upon atrocities. Even now in Northern California, my friends are in the way of a fire, right? Houston is wondering and looking down the barrel of another storm, right? Um, what's happening in the Middle East, right? What's happening all around us? Um, the world is difficult. And I think sometimes we want to check out a little bit. But the good news is we are required to only care for those who receive that care from us. So you can welcome in people, and if they receive your wisdom and healing, they will get the good news and your good self in abundance. And as we continue to journey together in our lives and in this community, I invite you to open yourselves up to the unexpected healing and wisdom of those around you. And that you don't try to pretend you have it all together. And that you occasionally allow yourself to not have all the answers or know all the things or do all the things. Instead, sometimes you can just come here to heal and worship and get and receive. Because the interesting dynamic in God's kingdom that Jesus shows for us is that you can only receive as much as you are willing to give. And the converse is true. If you want to be someone who's hospitable, you need to understand that you need people too. We need each other. The reason I think there is sometimes such a skewed take on Christianity in our culture the West, this time, this area, is because Christianity is truly incompatible with something that is a core value of our country, this lone ranger mentality. I don't need anybody or anything. 
Winning is key. Win at all costs. Do whatever it takes to win. Stomp on others if you have to. And also our commodification culture, right, where we use people as well as things to such a degree that we no longer see the humanity in each other. Do you see what I'm saying? Have you seen that and witnessed that? There are people all around the world who are afraid of the end times. And by that I mean the zombie apocalypse. The collapse of society and structures. Does anyone have any fear? that There's lots of movies about it. Do you have fear about that? That like maybe something might happen? I feel like if that happened, I would have no skills for the zombie apocalypse. I'm just going down. But there are people, and I think you're like, Aaron, where are you going with this? People. And they're building bunkers and stockpiling all kinds of food and stuff. Do you know people like that? Have you heard of people like that? They're stockpiling things in bunkers. And what I think is so interesting is that we in our Lone Ranger mentality have understood the idea that if anything goes wrong, anything happens, I will just go within myself and I will store up enough green beans to live a good life. <laughs> Am I right? I will stockpile the things, I will have the things, I will go in my shelter. But the problem is, and scientists and researchers and psychologists agree, that actually if everything were to go terribly wrong in our infrastructure, the only way we would all survive, do you know how? Is by relying on other people. Because the cans of green beans are gonna run out. I just focused on green beans because it felt very unpolitical. Um, Sometime you're gonna need to know someone who can what? Grow green beans. You're gonna need to know someone that can do lots of these things. And so the actual way in which we survive anything together, any difficult political thing, any difficult thing that happens in the world, the way we survive it is to rely on each other. This bunker mentality sometimes seeps into the church. I can do it myself. I'm self-sufficient, I, I know it all, I do it all. But the truth and the hard and the beautiful truth that we learn today, not only from the way, the walk of the Camino de Santiago, but also from Jesus' own journey on earth, is that we need each other. I need you and you need me. And community requires that sometimes we admit we don't know everything, we aren't right about everything, we don't have everything, we sometimes need help, we need shared wisdom, we need expertise beyond ourselves. And of course, the utmost need we have is for who? God, right? But I think for Jesus, proof that people relied on God, and this is where I want you to hear me, if you've been tuning out and the bunker thing was weird, you're not sure where we're going with the sermon. The proof to Jesus that people were relying on God was how they relied on others. How can we say we rely on God, a cosmic unknowing, unseen, unknowable, untouchable at times, when we can't rely on the things and people and resources we can touch and can know? So ultimately, and I'm hard to admit this because I, it goes, goes much against my life. I live alone, I have two cats, I would call myself fairly self-sufficient. So maybe none of you needed this sermon and I just needed this sermon preached to myself that self-sufficiency isn't the highest value of God's kingdom. I'm going to say it again. Self-sufficiency is wonderful, but it isn't the highest value of the kingdom that Jesus shows us. It isn't a value actually Jesus ever emulated. Think about it. Jesus could have run around and done things on his own, but did he? No, he chose friends and disciples. There were women in his ministry, people funding his ministry. He knew he could rely, he knew he had to rely on others. There was something about that community aspect, that diverse community coming together, walking together, doing these things, men and women, all the different kinds of disciples we hear about, doing this thing together. The doing of the thing of the kingdom of God is the kingdom of God, doing it together. Jesus never pretended to know it all and do it all. And I wonder again if our overly self-sufficient world and culture that we sometimes mistake that being a value in our faith. But today, I hope that you are reminded in the way that I'm reminded. And again, it may just be a sermon I needed to hear for myself, that hospitality, when it's God's hospitality, it goes both ways. 
Jesus knocks on the door, we're told, the door of our lives, and we invite him in. And then we, at times, cry out to God, and God invites us in. Hospitality is the bedrock of our faith, and hospitality goes both ways. It always has, and it always will. Amen. So this is the time that Karen introduced us to earlier, which is that we are a church that prays together. I wanted to make a correction in the prayer list, um, prayers for Ron Schubert. Um, he passed away, and um, we send Tim in particular and Julie all of our love and care as they deal with that loss. I also wanted to welcome in Dave Mook. We have not seen him in a long time. And he's been on the prayer list over and over and over again. 
and people have been asking about you. It's so good to see you here. And I know that Marilyn Giese, who always watches us online when she can, um, has had a biopsy surgery. It's all seemed to have gone well. So she wanted to say thank you to those who prayed for her. Um, she shares that in the women's prayer group, um, but I wanted to share it for all of you because she gave me permission. So any other prayer requests? We didn't get any physical in, but that's okay. It's summer. We might not be wanting to write, you know, uh, write in paper. Um, <laughs> are there any prayer requests that people have? I love how Wendy looks at me half the time and goes, Aaron, what you, what's happening? Continued prayers for our, our family friend, George, who is uh, still undiagnosed and um, doesn't seem to be doing so well. Okay. Family friend, George, undiagnosed, not doing so well. Any other prayer requests? Yes. Tim. I know, Alex did a great job again, <laughs> leading, leading that um, brigade. Because of my bruise, I did not partake of what I can only tell you in the experience of doing the shopping cart brigade is running with a shopping cart for two miles. Am I right? Yeah. So <laughs> I instead was, what? I, is it two miles? <laughs> I know, it felt like longer. I feel like it's about two miles, isn't it? I don't know. I feel like I did the, the, the pride parade in this. They felt similarly hot and hard and wonderful and <laughs> life-giving and beautiful. Any other prayer requests? Any other thoughts? I will pray for us then. As we pray, um, we will end together with the prayer that Jesus taught, which we call the Lord's Prayer. Join me. God, you are good and we are grateful. Um, we have loss in our community. We have those who are still struggling in our community. We have the joy of people returning to community. And God, we know that many are on vacation, and so we, pl we pray for traveling mercies and safety for them. And so God, we continue to lift up this community, this beloved, beautiful community. And we ask that you would continue to direct us and guide us and bless us along our way. And we will pray as we have prayed since the beginning, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And as we sing the next hymn, um, we will take our offering. Um, thank you, Tim, for playing many of the roles and all the things. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for communion. <laughs>
So I know that we're in the summer, and it says that you'll be coming up to communion, but um, I think today we are going to bring it out to you. So after I pray and do the communion liturgy, I will ask um, Howie and Dorothy and Tim to come on up and take the elements, um, and you will receive them. And what I'd like for us to do today, since there's not tons of us, and we did talk about how we need each other, um, let's hold on to each element till we're all done and we'll eat it together. Is that fair? It won't take very long, I think. But I feel like that's a beautiful sign of community for all of us. So please pray with me. God, you have blessed us with abundance and beauty and grace and goodness. You've given us in this community, both here that is seen and unseen out in the world watching, all that we need to create the beloved and beautiful community that lives into the hospitality of your kingdom, of the places where you take us on the way. God, may we continue to be people who look to the left and the right, that see people created and beloved by God no matter who they are, and ask them to give them us their wisdom and their healing and their joy, that we may be a community of abundance. We may be a community on a journey together that is life-giving and healing and way beyond ourselves. God, may we continue to experience your beautiful love and goodness as we are nourished and and refreshed by this meal that you have instituted so long ago by Jesus. Thank you for the bread. Thank you for the juice. May it nourish our souls for the journey ahead. Amen. And so long ago, Jesus on his own journey, as we know, one of grief and beauty and difficulty, took bread with all of those present, broke it, and said, this is my body, given to you for the abundance and beauty of all. May you take it and know it. May you experience it and understand that you are a part of something bigger. Partake of this and heal all of who you are in our presence. And then he took the cup and he blessed it and he poured it out to each and every one of them at that table. And he said, drink this, this is like my blood. This is like the lifeblood of who I am. This is to nourish you in all love and goodness. And they took it and they shared it because it was meant to be a symbol that they were a part of this together. And may you experience that this day, amen. Our community can come forward, thank you. There is gluten-free in the center as always. And I ask that you take a piece and pass it along and then hold it for us all to eat it together. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.
communion is what I call the community meal of love, and it's eating a meal together. And as you know, when you've traveled or in your own homes, when you eat together, you really get to know people. You get to learn from them and sit alongside them and soak in their wisdom and beauty. Please join me in the unison prayer of thanksgiving found in your bulletin and on the screens. Good and merciful God, we pray that our worship would be more than words spoken and sung and is made real in our lives. May this meal nourish our bodies and souls so that we might live in service to the world around us to your glory. Amen. Please join me in the closing song. of folks who will challenge us and love us and remind us of your goodness and grace. So may we go forth, taking in your hospitality of love and giving it away to the world. Alleluia. Join us in the fellowship hall, which you've just learned is central to your faith. Thank <laughs> you.